Hi, this is uh, Richard Hall here from uh, Stonehenge Aotearoa and uh, we're going to have a look at our current night sky that we've got at the moment which is, as you may, may, many of you know, is rather precious to us because it's uh, one of the few places around the world where you can actually see the stars in all their glory, the Milky Way and so on. And I always like to thank uh, Dan Browson, who is a great supporter of both the Diet Sky Project and, of course, uh, this show here. Well, what we're going to do tonight is we're going to uh, um, we're going to look at the, some of the bright stars that are in our sky at the moment, so what they actually physically are, and so on, and also that lost world out there. Right, so let's let's make a make a start. Well, the first thing you'll see once it gets to, uh, be, sun goes down, you're in the twilight sky. The thing, the first thing most of you immediately notice is a nice big bright star up in the northwest. Well, it's no star at all. That's actually the planet Venus, all right? uh, which at the moment we can call the evening star. Um, the evening star, the morning star, are both the same. They're the planet Venus. They're simply shining by the reflected light of the sun. But of course, in the ancient world, people believed that they were two entirely different objects that would appear. Uh, Venus is a, a planet very much the same size as the Earth, but of course it's quite a bit closer to the sun than at the moment. And uh, <clears throat> and it's actually one of those worlds that's shrouded in mystery because its entire planet, planet is covered in clouds, okay? But it never seems to be a break. Like if you're looking at the Earth from space, you can you see the clouds, but you also see breaks, so you can, after a while you can pick out the continents. This never happens uh, with Venus. And we, for a long while, people used to argue what was down on the surface of Venus. Was it a tropical swamp? Was it... Uh, what was there? Don't know. But anyway, eventually we did send a spacecraft there. And we discovered it's the nearest thing to hell that you can imagine. The surface temperature uh, on, on, <clears throat> on Venus uh, is an, hot enough to melt lead. Uh, the atmosphere contains concentrated sulfuric acid and the pressure is the sort of sort of pressure you experience at the bottom of an ocean. So when you go there, you actually get crushed, uh, vaporised and, um, uh, uh, and, and incinerated as well. But the interesting thing, what we're fascinated about Venus is that it hasn't always been like that. And there's good evidence that once upon a time in the distant past, Venus was like the Earth. And there is even some possibility that living things may still exist in the upper atmosphere. Essentially what's happened with Venus is it's had a suffer from a runaway greenhouse effect. And this has been due to the slow increase in brightness of the sun. Anyway, that's another story. We can, we can talk about that a little later. So that's Venus that you'll see in the evening, evening sky. Next to Venus, you also probably, as it begins to get dark, you'll see there's another star quite close to it. That is Regulus. All right, which is in fact the heart of the lion. All right, and there it is there. So Venus is in the constellation of uh, Leo the lion, which of course you can't see much of at the moment. Anyway, as it darkens, uh, Venus of course will disappear from our sky, and we get this magnificent panorama of stars that you can see there at the moment. Now I'm just going to pick out some of the bright stars. The Milky Way is rising up first of all in the northeast, comes virtually overhead. So when you're, for those of you who are watching this on TV, that big bright region at the top is actually you're looking at that overhead, and that is the richest part of the Milky Way. All right, and the masses of stars are concentrated along that. But looking due north, all right, when we look down there due north, there's a, a bright star. And it's got a definite bluish colour. Now, this is the bright star Vega. Vega is one of the brightest stars in the sky, but it's a northern star. And it only just sort of creeps up above the uh, horizon here uh, from the wire wrapper. And when I say blue, when you take photographs of it, it's got a definite bluish haze. And this is no coincidence because uh, Vega is, in fact, a very, very hot star. And... Um, a lot of its energy, unlike more, more than the sun, is being uh, generated and uh, sent out in blue wavelengths. If we could stand on the surface of a planet orbiting around uh, Vega, uh, well, we'd have to be at the right distance because, first of all, um, it's uh, something in the region of 37 times brighter than the sun. So we'd have to be a bit further away. 
and um, we'd be travelling out over 25 light years to get to uh, Vega. And remember, um, a uh, light year is a distance light travels in a year, all right? So if you could travel around the, uh, at the speed of light, you could whip around the Earth in less than a second. Uh, what amount of time it takes you to blink an eye, all right? But to get to Vega, you'd have to travel for 25 years, all right? That's how far away it is. So it's a hot, bluish white star. That's Vega. And it's also, we know it's a very young star. It's just 455 million years old. Now, you might think that's pretty old for hundreds of millions of years, but you've got to remember that's only one-tenth of the age of our sun. Uh, the life expectancies of stars are much greater than people. So on the scale of things, um, yeah, Vega's just a sort of a teenager, if you like, or something like that, or even probably less. So that's Vega that's in our sky at the moment. OK, now if you look along the horizon and you go to left to the north-west, you'll see another bright star, around about the same brightness as Vega, but you'll immediately notice it's a different colour. Now, this is the bright star Arcturus. Right? And indeed, uh, when we look at uh, Arcturus for a telescope or photograph, it's got a definitely yellow, yellow orange colour. Uh, quite a contrast with that of Vega. And this is because, in fact, Arcturus is, well, while Vega's hotter than the sun and liberates more energy, Arcturus is surface of its is cooler, right? But it's no small star. Though it's cooler and its surface energy liberates less energy, Arcturus is very, very bright. In fact, its uh, distance from us is again about 37 light years, but it's 170 times brighter than the sun. And the reason for that is that this thing has a gigantic surface area. Uh, Place, place the sun alongside it, you would discover that Arcturus has a diameter, a diameter of 26 times that of the sun. And this is what Arcturus is what we call a <coughs> red giant. Now, whereas um, Vega was a, a young baby star, this is an old star, uh, an old granddad star. And our sun itself, one day when it begins to run out of hydrogen, will turn into a red giant star. So you see stars, just like all other things, evolve through time. So that's Arcturus that we can see there at the moment. <coughs> up in the sky, excuse me. Then looking up a little bit above to Vega, <coughs> there's a little triplet of stars, the brightest is the star Altair. Now Altair is one of our neighbours, right? and uh, it's in the constellation of Aquila the Eagle. I won't pick out the eagle for you at the moment. You'll have to do that when you come out on one of our star viewing sites. Again, you'll find that uh, looking at Altair, it's a white with a tinge of blue. So, so again, this immediately gives you a clue that it's a, a really hot star, OK? <laughs> In fact, Altair is only about 17 light years away, all right? It's uh, about, about 11 times brighter than the sun. But the fascinating thing about Altair is that it's spinning on its axis so fast, instead of being nice and spherical like our sun, it's actually shaped into a ellipsoidal shape. In fact, it's spinning so fast that, um, well, it's just about the point of disintegration, all right? So if you had uh, Altair as a sun, all right, it would look, it'd look like a big disc up in the sky. So that's Altair, one of bright neighbours of our sun. And finally, uh, as far as the stars I wanted to look at, is let's go up and right up along the Milky Way and you can see a bright orange-red star. Again, you know this is cooler than the sun, right? Well, this is the star Antares. But Antares, although cooler, is a long, long way away, OK? Um, it's got a definite orangey-red colour. In fact, it's more red than Arcturus is. And what we discover, Antares, is a colossal star, what we call a supergiant, a red supergiant. Its distance from us is 605 light years. So when you look at Antares in the night sky, you're seeing it as it was over 600 years ago. And this star is 65,000 times brighter than the sun. Right? And this is because it's got a colossal size. Uh, next to it, our sun will look like just a dot um, in fact, Antares has a diameter of 800 times that of the sun. And as I say, and it actually varies in brightness because this star slowly pulsates, ejecting matter into space. 
But when you look at it through a telescope, one of the first things you notice is it's not its own. It has a companion star. Uh, so Antares is not a single star like our sun. It has got a companion. But in contrast, its companion is hot. And when you look at it through the telescope, <coughs> you get this wonderful contrast of like a, one, a ruby, a big bright ruby with a little sapphire star behind it. Now, the little sapphire star, uh, we'll, I just call it Antares B, orbits around the bigger star in a period of about 900 years. All right? And it is, as I said, a bluish star and a little bit like... Um, uh, the entire, the other one star we were looking at Altair a little bit earlier, it too is spinning rather rapidly, but this is a much bigger star and it's very, very hot and blue. In fact, Antares B, although you can't see it without a telescope, is actually 3,000 times brighter than the sun. Right? And this star is spinning around also, ejecting matter. Now, me showing you these pictures of these stars, you might get the impression that our sun is rather feeble oh uh, it's not our sun is actually quite a bright star it's just that when we look at the night sky the stars that capture our, our our vision are the giant stars a bit like looking across the paddock right and you see the cows and possibly the sheep but you miss the thousands of other animals there and the mice and the weevils and so on they're also out there and much the same with the Milky Way. Uh, when we look up there at night, we see the big giant stars, and they sort of capture eyes. But our sun is a really respectable star. In fact, it's brighter than most stars in the sky. Anyway, there's, there's uh, Antares up in the sky there. And Antares is the heart of the scorpion. Right? And actually, when you look up there, you'll easily pick up the, uh, the pattern leading upwards away from Antares. It's this great curve of stars, which is the tail of the scorpion, which to Maui down here, of course, was the, known as the fishhook of Maui. Right? Now, when we look up at this region and we're looking at near Scorpius in the brightest region of Milky Way, we're actually looking towards galactic centre. Now, we can't see the centre, which is over 30,000 light years away, um, because it's hidden behind the dark clouds of the Milky Way. All right? But that's where it is. And here's a, for those of you who can see at home, here's a beautiful photograph actually taken from here, from a Stonehenge Arteria of that central region, the Milky Way. And you can see the vast numbers of stars. And when it's bright, it's just simply so many stars, they sort of all bunch bl blended in together. Then you've got dark patches, which are clouds. And you can see bright orangey colours. That's where new stars are being formed. <coughs> now, in this region here is what is known as the Galactic Kiwi. So can you see the Galactic Kiwi? Well... I'll let you have a look at it for a while because what we're going to do is play a little bit of music for a little while. Uh, what we've got now is Galaxy Rise uh, by Jim Wormsley. Right, so...
Okay, you're uh, back with Richard at the, the night sky and uh, looking at the Milky Way. Now, do you, have you managed to pick out the galactic kiwi yet? Okay, well, we'll bring the kiwi up. There it is there, okay? There's the galactic kiwi. And when you look at well, actually, once your eyes pick it out, it's actually quite obvious in the, in the night. You pick it out quite easily in the night sky, on a clear, dark sky from here in the wire wrapper. So there's a galactic kiwi. Right. OK, so I wanted to talk about the lost planet. Uh, there was Venus in our sky earlier. Uh, most of the other planets are either in the morning sky. So in our evening sky, we've got no bright planets. But there is another. There is a planet in our night sky. And for those of you watching this on TV, I'll just pick it out to you there. That's where the planet is. Now, you won't see anything there because it's actually very, very faint. All right. It's a rather special planet. It's in the constellation of Capricornus. And this... A thing we're looking at right, is in fact the planet Pluto and don't even try with binoculars to look at Pluto you need a pretty large telescope just to see it at all, all right? traveling at the speed of light it would take you over five hours to get to Pluto and it is a, a frozen world of ice and when I won't say frozen I mean it's truly cold all right now its distance from the Sun is what we call uh, just under 40 astronomical units now, an astronomical unit is, a, is a, what astronomers use to measure things in the solar systems and so on. And it's a, an astronomical unit is a distance between the sun and the earth, right? So when we say that uh, Pluto's distance is 40 astronomical units, it means its distance in space is 40 times further away other than the earth. <coughs> and it's so cold out there, and I mean really, really cold, um, <coughs> surface temperature average surface temperature is minus 230 degrees Celsius. And that's not very far away from absolute zero. In fact, uh, while uh, we say, uh, uh, you know, it's composed of ice, at these temperatures, ice is so hard and solid and dry that it's as hard and dry as rock. So that if you were on Pluto, the surface appears to be like rock, but it's actually composed of frozen water, all right? So that's a planet Pluto, all right? So we know from what we've seen with um, spacecraft and so on, it's got m mountains of water ice, which rise up two to three kilometres, and each has got a, a coating of frozen methane, which often gives it a yellowy or brownish colour to it as well. Right. Now, <coughs> Pluto, we also discovered, is not on its own. Um, it's actually like a double planet because it's got a moon, what we call moon. Its moon is Charon, but Charon is at least half the size of Pluto. So I would say we really call it a double planet. And Charon, again, is another ice world very similar to Pluto. Now, Pluto, we discovered, doesn't just have one moon. Since we've been observing it, we've been telescopes, we actually discovered it's got a total of five moons. Uh, these other ones are Nix, Styx, <laughs> Nix and Styx, uh, Kerberos and Hydra. All right? But these, are, these ones are so faint that you can only pick them up with very, very large telescopes. And for those of you uh, looking on TV, I've just brought up an, an image, a photograph of uh, Charon. Again, a fascinating world where you can see there appears to be geological activity. You can see crater impacts and so on. But again, this is a world made a, like a glass world. I could call it ice, but it's so cold it's just like glass. All right? That's Charon. So there's these two actually seen, but we're often known as the lost planet these days because as some of you may are aware, with certainly if you're in my age group, when you grew up, Pluto was counted as the last outermost planet, the nine planets. But it was demoted a few years ago and they decided that Pluto could no longer be called a planet, right? And it was demoted and called a dwarf planet, right? And the reason for this is it's actually small size. Um, in part, it's small size because here, for those of you uh, game watching on TV, you can see I've got the Earth, Charon and Pluto to scale and can see how small Pluto actually is. In fact, it's actually smaller than our moon. OK, that wouldn't worry us too much as astronomers, but the interesting thing is we've discovered literally hundreds of um, 
uh, objects similar to this. In fact, just beyond the orbit of Neptune, there's at least 10 other dwarf planets out there. All right? And I'm going to be talking about those at a, later, at a later stage. But we needed to classify it because looking out into space, where one points out, we used to believe, oh, every star has probably got planets. We now know this is almost certainly true, and we've discovered thousands of planets around other stars, all right? And we needed to be able to classify what type of planet it was, whether it was a gas giant, a Neptunian-type star. If it was a Pluto, that planet, well, we needed to call it dwarf planet. So that's the idea, what's happened with that, all right? We do know, for example, that um, there are, we discovered just the last few years, um, as, as I said earlier, about uh, 10 worlds, beyond uh, uh, where Pluto is. And there is some evidence there is another planet, not just a dwarf planet, but an actual planet there, out there in space. So there you go. Lots of worlds to discover. And we'll be discuss discussing these in the near future. Anyway, I was going to put some more music on for you now, but uh, we seem to be running short of time, so I'd better carry on. I want to show you a few other things. So if we turn around to look to the south, we see the Milky Way plunging out into the uh, south um, eastern horizon, uh, sorry, southwestern horizon, and you can see the Southern Cross, which is laying on its side at the moment. All right, and the way in which we always use to find the Southern Cross, as to identify it from other crosses in the sky, of course, is the two pointer stars. All right. Now, the interesting thing about the pointer stars is the uh, brightest of the two pointer stars is the third brightest star in the sky. And this star is bright, not like all the other ones because it is so b physically bright. It's actually the nearest star to the solar system. And this is Alpha Centauri. All right. Now, and it's only just over four light years away. And interesting thing is that you can see this in quite a small telescope. If you look at Alpha Centauri, you'll see that you see not one sun, but two suns. And these two suns orbit around each other in all right. But the interesting thing also is both of these suns are fill stars are similar to our sun. The brighter of the two is a little bit brighter than our sun, and the other one is a little bit fainter. But again, it's a binary system with two stars orbiting around each other, but both of these could possibly have worlds all right, orbiting around them. This is what we thought, but now we know it's actually true that around both of these stars there appears to be other planets. Uh, there's probably quite a lot of them, but at the moment we've discovered just a small number, but the number is growing. Now, the two stars orbit around their centre of gravity, and the distance between them, the two, varies. But it, it takes about 80 years for the stars to orbit, uh, one, the smaller star to orbit around the bigger star. Right? So over time, uh, you see the distance between the two stars, as seen from Earth, will actually vary, and also their position in the sky. All right? But as I just mentioned, it was almost certain that there's um, a quite a variety of planets there. And of course, the possibility, what we're so excited about, is there's always a possibility there's an Earth-like planet there orbiting, which has got water on it, and it has the same conditions similar to the Earth, except that it would, in its sky it would have two suns instead of one. But there's also a possibility. But the other interesting thing about um, Alpha Centauri is that um, it's much older than our sun. It's about a billion years older, all right? But who knows what may have evolved on some of those planets out there. So these are things that we're sending out spacecraft. And as things develop, technology develops, we're discovering more and more about these remote worlds. All right. So, but Alpha Centauri is not just a single st uh, double star. Close to Alpha Centauri is another star, which you cannot see without a telescope. But many scientists claim, it, and it appears to be now part of the Alpha Centauri system. And it's a little faint star known as Proxima Centauri. Right? And when, when you do look at it through a telescope, it looks like a ruby because it is a red star. And though it's, it, at the moment, its position makes it, in fact, the closest star of all, apart from the sun. And it's about a, a tenth of a light year closer than the other two. All right. So this is what we've, we've discovered. And it's a little tiny faint red star. In fact, in visible light, it's only one twenty thousandth the brightness of the sun. And this is because not only is it red, 
and very cool, but it's very small. It's actually not much bigger than the planet Jupiter. Its total energy output is about 600 times that of the sun, uh, uh, one six hundredth that of the sun. That's because most of its energy, I mean well over 90 percent, is all in the form of infrared. And we've discovered planets around this star. And one of them is so close to this star that it could actually be in what we call the habitable zone where life could exist. But don't expect to find life out there. I am round the Proxima because it is a violent star, small, but it's subject to massive explosions. And any planet like our Earth, with these explosions, its atmosphere will get completely blasted off into space and its surface irradiated by deadly radiation. So while Proxima is an interesting world, it's not, um, and its worlds may be very interesting, I don't think any of them are actually going to be able to support life, all right? Now, if you were, however, if you were standing on one of these um, planets of Mount Proxima, and you looked up into the sky, you'd discover that our sun, you wouldn't be able to see the Earth, of course, on any planets, our sun would just look like another star. In fact, not even the brightest star in the sky. It would be about, I think, about the third or fourth brightest star. And it would be in the constellation of Cassiopeia, which we can't see from here because it's in the northern hemisphere. So from Proxima, our sun would just be another star in the sky. OK, now just to finish off, to let you know what we've got happening at Stonehenge. Uh, we're open at the moment, weekends and school hol and public holidays from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. each day. So you can go in a trek around the Stone Circle. Just finish up. And um, so we've got that. And there's exhibitions that we have there at the moment as well. And also, if you wish, there's also uh, guided tours where you get all the storytelling and so on. And just finally, to finish off, to tell you that uh, at the Medici Cafe in Martinborough, uh, this Thursday at 6.30, I'm going to be there, and I'm going to be giving a presentation called This Island Earth. And it starts off by saying there's only two possibilities. And this is based upon a famous saying which says, there are only two possibilities, either we are alone in the universe or we are not. Both are equally terrifying. And the reason for that, I will be explaining at the Medici. So you can come along there, have some food and drink, and listen to me yakking on about aliens and so on. Having said that, I'll be quiet now, and I'll catch up with you in the near future. Hello again, we'd like to pay thanks to the Trust House Foundation. <laughs>